We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the life in the world to come. Amen. That was the Nicene Creed, or to give it its fuller title, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'll refer to it from this point on simply as the Nicene Creed. Depending on your church background, you may or may not be familiar with it. It is a creed that is accepted and used by the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, and many Protestant church groups and denominations. It will be the subject of this study today. In this study, we're going to look at four distinct areas. Firstly, we'll consider what exactly is a creed. Secondly, we'll think about are creeds biblical? Thirdly, we'll consider are creeds beneficial? And finally, I'm going to give a brief historical background to the Nicene Creed. So, first let's consider, what is a creed? So it's a logical place to begin in defining what exactly we mean by the word creed. Now the word creed comes from credo, the Latin word that means we believe. Probably the best known creed is the Apostles' Creed. It's still used uh, by many churches today. And it begins, of course, with the statement, I believe. So in very simple terms, a creed may be defined as a set of beliefs that influences the way you live. Or a statement of the shared beliefs of an often religious community in the form of a fixed formula summarizing core tenets. So... In essence, then, a creed is an authoritative statement of the main articles of faith to which an adherent of that faith is expected to assent or believe. In Christian terms, a creed is a statement of faith that summarises the main points of the faith that are common to all Christians. A creedal statement, then, ought to clearly state what all Orthodox Christians accept and agree. In this regard, it is different to a confession of faith, which are associated with particular denominations. So many different denominations can unite and agree upon a creed, whilst they may differ on various points within their respective confessions. Let's consider whether creeds are biblical. The first point I want to emphasize here is that creeds are not in themselves part of God's revelation. We believe as evangelical Christians that all scripture has come about through the inspiration of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Creeds, by contrast, are essentially man-made constructions. They are the work of human beings who are attempting to make a systematic formula that briefly explains or outlines 
what is revealed in Scripture. This means that they are never to be regarded as being equal with Scripture. It's perfectly fine for us to study them, to read them, recite them, memorize them and use them in our worship, but we must never equate them with Scripture. As Protestant believers, we hold to the principle of sola scriptura. This means that Scripture alone is our supreme authority in all spiritual matters. We must never allow creeds or other human constructions to take the Bible's place or position of the Bible's authority. The next thing to consider is the relationship between a creedal statement and God's revealed word. Now, the scope of this brief study will not, be, will not permit me to talk about this at great length. But biblical religion, I would argue, has always been creedal. Human beings have always sought to express their religious instincts through three main means. A. Through a ritual. B. Through a formula that defines or explains the ritual or creed. And C. Through a prescribed way of living. All religion is centred around the worship or recognition of a deity. The way of communicating with this deity takes place through a ritual. Once a ritual has been established, practitioners must then attempt to rationalise or explain this ritual in a way that makes it understandable to themselves and others. This is where the creed is employed. Finally, the ritual and ex explanation through the formula are adopted as a way of life. Let me take you back to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, we read the Shema, the basic declaration of Jewish belief. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is a creedal statement. It is a statement of the shared belief of the Jewish people which summarizes what they believe about Yahweh. In the Gospels, we find statements of belief that we might broadly designate as creedal. Even if we don't accept them as creedal statements at the moment of their utterance, at the very least we might identify them as statements that in an oral tradition would later feed into creedal proclamations. They are the seeds, if you like, that would later grow into more complete statements. For example, Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel, from John 1, 49. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, John 20, 28. However, it is in the New Testament epistles that we find the real indications of such statements of belief as may be designated as creedal. Paul's epistles in particular are rich in statements that express in creedal form what we believe about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. So at their best, the creeds express biblical truth. Christians throughout the centuries have written and recited creeds to express the faith that lived within their hearts. The Bible teaches us that as the people of God, we, are, we have something to confess to the world. Therefore, I would argue to use creeds is biblical. The third point to consider, are creeds beneficial? I think we've demonstrated that creeds or creedal statements have a biblical basis. The question that follows on from this is what benefit they have for us today. 
Now there are some today who hold the creed in low regard. They look at them and consider them to be old-fashioned, or that they are too closely associated with the ritual of the Roman Catholic Church. However, I think there is also a movement today pushing for the return to some of the older, more traditionally rooted ways of worship. I think there are several benefits to continuing to use the creeds. I personally include a congregational reading of the Apostles' Creed as part of my Sunday worship service. And there are four reasons why I think it's beneficial and useful. The first point to make is that creeds serve as a good systematic summary of what we believe. It's useful, I think, to have the congregation or any group of believers openly and publicly express what they hold to be true. It's good for believers to express this together and have it through repetition committed to memory. At the very least, if they're asked what it is that a Christian believes by a stranger, then they can fall back upon the creed to give an answer. It's also useful for new Christians or new visitors to the church. A creed does not explicitly express what a church believes in all areas, but it does broadly demonstrate that they are orthodox believers. The creeds then serve as a good, unchanging standard of what we believe. Second point is that the creeds connect us to history. There can, I think, be a tendency today towards historical isolationism. We can easily forget that we are not the first generation of Christians. We stand on the shoulders of all the generations who have come before. And we would not be at the point that we are today without them and their valuable contributions. The creed then serves as a means of connecting us back to others who have also recited this creed and held to its truths. The third point to make is that the creed serves to unite us. As I said before, I think there's something very powerful about a group of people all coming together and stating at the same time their allegiance to an idea or a belief. This is the value, I think, of the creed. The final point is that the creed can be a good standard or basis for church discipline. And this is in some ways linked back to the first reason. Because the creeds provide a standard of truth, they can be used to show where error or disagreement lie. So very simply, if all the members of a congregation believe A, as stated in a creed, and someone denies point A and believes instead point B, then clearly we can see where disagreement exists and where action or some kind of uh, intervention is needed. In conclusion then, provided we correctly understand what a creed is, and that it does not take the place of scripture, I think they can be beneficial and helpful for us today. Let's go on then to consider the background of the Nicene Creed. To understand the importance and significance of the Nicene Creed, we need a short history lesson. The first three centuries of the Christian church were difficult. Christians had many issues with which to grapple. Hostility towards the new faith, problems conveying in different cultures the gospel message, and in many areas they were open to persecution for their Christian faith. In 312 AD, Constantine won control of the Roman Empire at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. He claims that prior to the battle, he saw a vision of a burning cross in the sky with the message, In this sign you will conquer. Following success in the battle, he attributed his victory to the intervention of Jesus Christ. And upon becoming Roman Empire, Emperor, he elevated the status of Christianity and became the first emperor to openly claim to be a Christian. It's not quite true to say that Christianity became the state religion, but it certainly enjoyed a favoured position among all the other religions of the Roman Empire. Constantine's motto was, One God, one Lord, one faith, one church, one empire, one emperor. 
So after many years of unease and turmoil in the Roman Empire, Constantine hoped that the Christian faith would bring about peace and unity. The problem was that the church itself was at that time in a state of disunity and division. The church therefore was in no position to serve as a unifying force in society. Constantine was left with no option but to intervene personally. He travelled to the east where the most trouble was located. The most troublesome dispute had arisen in Alexandria, in modern day Egypt. This dispute was centred around Arius, pastor of the influential Bocolis church. And he had come into conflict with the Bishop Alexander around the year 318 AD. Arius had openly challenged the teachers at that time, including Bishop Alexander, by asserting that the word, the Logos, who assumed flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, was not the true God. He, the Logos, possessed, according to Arius, an entirely different nature and was neither eternal or omnipotent. Jesus Christ was, in Arius's view, to be regarded as a lesser being or a half-God. The reason for this was because God had created him, and though he was the first and the greatest of all created things, he was still created. Now today we know this heresy by the term Arianism, and we might also note in passing that this heresy persists to this day, most notably in the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Arius's teaching resonated at the time and appealed to many of the new Christians who had come from a pagan background. Pagans had great difficulty understanding and accepting that the word, Jesus, existed from all eternity and was co-equal with the Father. It seemed far more believable, logical if you like, to think of Jesus as a divine hero, greater than human beings, but not as great as God. This, of course, was a familiar motif in many of the pagan myths and legends. Arius, therefore, had gathered quite a following. By all accounts, he was an eloquent and persuasive preacher. He also had a flair for public relations. He had the very clever idea of putting his ideas into easy-to-remember rhymes or jingles. Modern advertisers, of course, know how powerful this method can be. I can still sing some of the jingles I heard on television in the 1980s. Soon people all over Alexandria were singing his jingles and absorbing through them his theology. Thankfully, Bishop Alexander was having none of it. He called a synod in Alexandria and the assembled churchmen condemned Arius and excommunicated him from the church. Arius, however, refused to give up. He went to his friend Eusebius, Bishop of Nicodemia in modern Turkey, and won his support and backing. The theological quarrel between Arius and Bishop Alexandria, Alexander became a test of strength between the two most important churches in the East. To illustrate quite how divisive and serious this matter was to the people at that time, at one point Arius returned to Alexandria and it resulted in riots erupting on the streets. So Constantine had no choice but to step in and try to settle the matter once and for all. He called for a council to meet at Nicaea, not far from Nicodemia in 325 AD. It was quite rightly proclaimed as the first world council of the church. Around about 220 bishops attended. Proceedings began on May the 20th of 325, with Constantine himself urging the bishops to work towards unity and peace. Division in the church, he went on to say, was worse than war. The conflict with Arius was quickly resolved. The main issue was whether Bishop Alexander's condemnations, condemnation against Arius would stand. Arius was called in to speak, and despite having few supporters, he made an impassioned defence. The Son of God, he affirmed, was a created being, made from nothing. 
There had been a time when he had not existed. He was capable of change and also of alternating between good and evil. Arius was rightly denounced for his views. Eusebius, who had in fact only been a half-hearted supporter of Arius, submitted his own creed, showing how his views were actually quite orthodox. However, it was soon recognised that a stronger, more unified creed was needed to stop the Arian heresy once and for all. The bishops got together to produce what we now refer to as the Nicene Creed. The creed was strongly anti-Arian, as it affirms that the Son is of one substance with the Father. 218 of the 220 bishops present signed the creed. Arius, in case you were wondering, was expelled from the church and died in 336 AD. The creed then follows basically the same structure as the Apostles' Creed. It mentions all three members of the Trinity in a similar order and retains the snapshot of the Gospel story when it describes Jesus. It also expands the description of the life and work of Christ, explicitly stating that his mission was for us and for our salvation. Like all the ecumenical creeds, the Nicene Creed does not set forth any specific theory or view of atonement. Still, in its final form, the creed tells us that Christ's mission for our salvation, including coming down out of heaven and taking on flesh from the Virgin Mary in the Incarnation, carrying that flesh in suffering through life and into death on the cross. The creed declares that Jesus Christ was crucified by Pontius Pilate for us. We know from scripture that Christ died for us to take our place of suffering and to set us free to receive salvation. The creed deliberately draws on tradition to show that the ideas put forward here are not the innovation to the faith delivered once for all. So in wrapping things up, the Nicene Creed encapsulates what scripture says about the relationship between the three persons of the Godhead and acknowledges the mystery of it. So I hope that when you hear or read it from now on, you'll have a greater understanding and appreciation of where it came from and of the historic events that prompted its production.